home, I knew that I wanted to tell a story about this dreamy, imaginative teenage girl. Um, the type of character that I wished I could have seen more films about when I was that age. And I started writing the script um, while I was at NYU in film school. And while developing the feature, I made a short film, um, which dealt with similar themes. And um, so the kind of personal nature of this film is the mother character in the film is my mother in real life. And so I grew up in somewhat unusual circumstances. My mom has MS, and she has been in a wheelchair since I was like two years old. And so as I was writing the script, that just naturally worked its way in. And again, I've, I've never seen a film where there's a disabled actor on screen ever, and was right. just hungry for, for representations of yeah. myself on screen. And that motivated me to not just make this film, but become a filmmaker and go to film school. Right. And so anyway, so I made a short film, a 10 minute short, that also cast my mom and a 16 year old girl. And um, as like a personal test of, is this something I could do for a feature? And it was very successful, not just personally, but financially and it, you know, got student academy awards and a ton of festivals and I put together the feature while traveling the festival circuit with that short. I kind of brought on yeah. producers and you know, all the crew and, and so forth. And I just graduated from NYU last year. Um, so did you recast like the lead role when for yes. the feature? Okay. Yeah. Um, and I and our lead actress, Natalia Dyer, um, she was sixteen. Oh wow when we were filming, and so, and again, and I did that with the short as well, I knew I wanted, the same way I wanted, I couldn't imagine casting an actress to play disabled, like an able-bodied actor, I, I right. knew I wanted a real 16-year-old to play 16, right. so um, I recast. Well, Natalia and um, Peter, Peter back, who is a USC alumni. Right, they're amazing. Um, can you just talk a little bit about your process in casting them, and how you worked with them on the roles, because they're, they're just, She's amazing, and so she's really special. Yeah, and um, I cast the net really wide. Um, it's difficult to find teenage girls who know they want to be actors and aren't already in the next big Nickelodeon thing. You know, it's a very narrow range, and so I asked everyone I knew who was the best teen actors they'd seen, and I came across Natalia through the casting directors for a Coen Brothers film, True Grit. Um, they had just done a nationwide talent search for a 14-year-old. Uh, that Haley Steinfeld got, yeah. and so Natalia was, you know, in their top three. She was on their radar, and I looked her up, and I Facebooked her, mm -hmm. and we Skyped, mm -hmm. and she was a junior in Nashville, Tennessee. Wow. Um, she flew out to meet me, and I just fell in love with her, and it was her first feature film as well, wow. so we really kind of were, you know, brave and vulnerable together. Right. Um, and then Peter Back, I cast much more traditionally. Uh, we have the same agent, and he had been in, in things before. He's on an MTV show, and so how did the jungle. how did you sort of get them to? I mean, it's so intimate, and like it really rides with line between fun and loving, and then uncomfortable and violent at times. And I mean, how did you sort of work with them on those scenes? So we um, had a really intimate way of working. Um, we shot the film as chronologically as possible um, with a real skeleton crew, especially for the sex scenes, anything violent or sex related. Um, you know, often I'd be operating, there'd be someone doing sound, the two actors, and her mom, her mom was there the whole time. And um, it was almost like a documentary way of shooting. Um, and we were shooting on 16 millimeter, but we still, we would do things in just long takes, yeah. lots of close-ups, and I really just let them especially for the most intimate scenes. And we talked about it first, and we would block things out, but we didn't do a lot of rehearsing. I really just created a safe space and then let them go. And then when she kind of reached her you know, end point, we would stop. Um, why did you decide to shoot on 16? I love the way it looks, and it like gives it a very special feel. I... Um, it goes back to the character. So I wanted to tell a story about this artistic, creative teenage girl that we so rarely see on screen. I mean, we so rarely see movies that have female protagonists, but I wanted this dreamy girl, and therefore, um, I wanted to tell the story as subjectively as possible, as much as it could be from her perspective. And so all of the aesthetic decisions were made with that in mind. And 16 millimeter felt like that kind of grainy, gritty, nostalgic quality. Um, we shot on Super 8 millimeter as well. But primarily, actually primarily Super 16, and then some straight 16. And, um, and then for the fantasy sequences, 
of stop motion puppet animation, that was done on 16 millimeter too. Um, which again, the idea was to make it feel as handcrafted as possible, as if this girl could have created this world. Yes. You can like see her fingerprints on the edges of the frame. Um, and I know from a producing perspective, it was actually cheaper to shoot on 16 millimeter because um, we got Fuji donated all of the film stock wow. right before they stopped making it. Um, <laughs> and a camera package was free and, and so forth. Um, it ended up actually being financially viable to shoot 16. I don't know if I'll ever have the opportunity to right. do that again. Yeah. So. Um, it was kind of a little, almost a referential thing to that with the Polaroid camera because, I mean, when you said they donated the film, it's like, oh. There's a Polaroid. Polaroid. So, Polaroid, um, so I, I'm a photographer as well, and I love Polaroid. And Polaroid went out of business like right before we made this movie. And so, Polaroid film is like really expensive yeah, now yeah, on yeah. eBay. Um, and I just had some like in my closet. Uh, so, we used what I had. And then there's this company called The Impossible Project that are these like ex Polaroid employees who got together and are like recreating the chemistry of Polaroid. Um, and so they sponsored our film and they donated wow. a bunch of that's so awesome. <laughs> impossible film. And I'm like, <laughs> those are precious. I know. Like, um, so I did want to talk about the female subjectivity and the perspective that you bring to it and also the fantasy sequences and the animation. So I'm so glad that you already sort of brought that up because I do think that um, especially a story about young female sexuality, and it's not often that we see it pulled from a perspective that is wholly hers and wholly female. So um, I think it's so amazing and rare that we do get to see these kinds of representations, and I'm so glad that we're seeing more and more people are able to talk about women behind the camera and how important that is. I mean, that's one of the hugely important things to me that I'm like constantly talking about and working on and beating the drum on. So. Um, I don't know if I have a question, except yeah, that I just I want to bring it up. <laughs> um, I, well, in addition to being a director, I also founded a film collective, and we're called Film Fatals. Um, so if there are any women, are there any women directors in the audience? One. Oh, three. Nope. Not in mind. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, two. Well, that's great. So we'll talk after. But um, the idea behind Film Fatals is it is um, a community of women featured directors, um, primarily narrative, some documentary, and we get together every month and talk about film and support each other and collaborate on projects. And it's a real peer mentoring program to support us. Um, because in Hollywood, it's less than 5% of directors are women. There's an incredible gender bias um, that's been around forever. And I, as soon as I left NYU, it became very apparent that I was you know, the only female director in the room the majority of the time. And so I founded this community of other women, and it's been the best thing. So the entire time I've been traveling the film festival circuit with unicorns, every time I'm in a new city, if I meet two other female directors, I help them start a local chapter. So we now have um, two dozen groups around the world who all get together, and it's a real, like, let's all lift each other up uh, platform. Well, I mean, it is so, the industry is so institutionally biased that, like, the mentoring is so important because there's not a lot of role models, there's not a lot of... Catherine Bigelow can't mentor all of us. Right, you know? exactly. And so the idea is we're all figuring this out, we're all making our films, mm -hmm. let's share resources, let's share knowledge, and, you know, Unicorns has been in theaters in New York uh, for several weeks now, um, and we're about to do our San Francisco theatrical next week, and after every screening we've been doing panel discussions with other female directors from the group. Um, you know, from Deborah Granick, who did Winter's Bone, and Mary Heron, American Psycho, and here in LA there's a film called Diary of a Teenage Girl by Maya yeah, Heller that's coming out later this summer. So if you like Unicorns, you should absolutely check that out. We did a conversation just on Tuesday here in Hollywood. So the idea is let's, you know, let's support each other, let's help each other, and create visibility so that more women will pursue directing, right. and more financiers will give money to women directors. Um, I have one more question about the story and then I'll open up to the audience. Um, I was sort of struck thinking about, I, I think I thought about this the first time I saw it, but uh, it's this classic story in the sense of young love, they're on the run, there are a lot of themes that you are familiar with and then it's done in this totally different way with the fantasy sequences and the animation but it's also sort of embracing like the dark side of that at the same time like, or even just like 
oh my god, I've been in the car with this person for days, and we haven't showered, and we haven't eaten, and what are the realities of that? And sort of, they're, they're very kid-like, but they're also trying to be grown-ups, so what was like, yeah. It's like in the middle of all, and that was very purposeful. It's like a collage of a film. It's very messy, and, um, because life is messy, and that, those teenage romances are messy. Um, and, you know, we reference, we're very aware of other coming-of-age films, you know, Badlands is an obvious reference. Um, and yet, really, we're trying to tell it as much as possible from her perspective, and it's muddled, because she's still figuring it out. Um, and it's not until the end of the film that she begins to realize you know, who she is and who she's going to be. And I think, I mean, I think we've all been in those relationships where we're with someone and we know they're wrong for us. There's like a little voice in the back of our mind that's like, this relationship is doomed to fail. This is not going to work. Maybe both people are good people, but they're bad for each other. And yet love is almost like this addiction. It's like this, these characters are holding on to this idea, this fantasy of what they think love should be without really realizing that what they have in front of them is broken. And so, um, yeah, the entire structure of the film is kind of going about it in a more fragmented uh, technique, I guess, than you might be used to seeing. And then there was one other thing. Sorry, guys, I'm hogging all the questions. Um, I noticed after the scene in the barn, there's, like, no dialogue until we get her voiceover underneath the pool, uh, or in the pool, underneath the water. Um, when she says, I don't, I have so much to say, and I don't know what to say. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what, yeah. how, you, how you sort of wrote that, and what, what you were trying to convey with those scenes? Um, so, to me, the film kind of, it starts in water, and it ends in water, and it's, in many ways, um, it's about this character trying to find her voice, and she's been holding her breath basically the whole movie. And to me, that has several different meanings. Um, in terms of her relationship with her mom, it's this, almost fear of contagion, of illness, which is something I had as a young girl, as I was afraid it was hereditary, and I was, you know, my ultimate fear was that I would also lose, you know, lose facility of my legs. And so there's that part of it, and then there's just her finding her self-confidence and learning where to draw her boundaries and who she is as a person, and it's really not until she's kind of gone on this journey and returned home and realized she's starting to grow up. And so we um, did a lot of things with voice and with silence, and um, we cut the credits a little early, but the music in the credits is finally her voice comes through, and whereas like earlier in the film, she's humming, and there's right. a lot of stuff with breath, and yeah. no, there's kind of just this metaphor of yeah, There's a lot breathing. of interesting sound design stuff. Yeah. Um, all right, yeah. I will stop hogging all the questions. Yes, sir. Uh, can you talk about the, uh, the, the time period that you set it in, why you picked that period, and what kind of challenge it was to shoot uh, such a low-budget movie. Uh, you know, so the question is about the time period, and the answer is, um, it's like the late 90s, early 2000s, which is when I was that age. Um, and yet, I try to make the film still feel timeless, so that it feels relevant today. And I've shown this film hundreds of times, and often there's a lot of teenage girls in the audience, and it's fascinating, because they all say, oh, like, what Instagram filter did you use? And I'm like, oh, no, it's Polaroid. Like, but there is this kind of, like, the selfie and the self-portrait. You know, there is this, we've kind of come full circle in this way. Um, and similarly, in that I wanted it to feel timeless in terms of we're not quite sure what time and place we are. I also wanted it to feel timeless, like, you're not quite sure how long they've been on the road, or... You know, it's like how far they've, how far gone. they've gone, yeah. or time. I wanted to really play with time and make it. It's like when you, when you are, you know, madly in love with someone, time can stay still, um, or moments can seem like weeks. And so, kind of again, the subjectivity, this idea of being in her mind, and it's messy. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm sure the guy right next to you, or not. Yeah, you, you know, especially like with the reference to Badlands, you often you see two kids in a car and you have an expectation they're going to rob a bank or Bonnie and Clyde, someone's going to get murdered or something. And in my experience, just being a teenager is messy enough and dramatic enough without <laughs> without a gun, you know? Anyone else? Sure. So, 
the question is about financing. Can you answer the budget? Thing? Yeah, I can over sold in the ready yeah. distribution. But yeah, it was a SAG ultra low. Um, so our production budget was around fifty thousand um, dollars, and then with post production closer to a hundred thousand all in. And um, I raised the funding in a variety of ways. I applied for every grant under the sun, which is normally something that documentary films do, but narrative films can do that as well. And so I was lucky enough to receive funding from, from NYU, uh, where I went to school, and then also the Adrian Shelley Foundation, which gives money to female-directed films specifically, and Tribeca Film Institute. They have a program called Tribeca All Access, which gives grants to women and people of color. Um, and they're phenomenal. They've mentored me, not just during their labs. They're kind of like the Sundance Labs, but they're more fi about finances. Um, but they've mentored me all year long. Um, and then I also received a grant from IFP, which is an organization in New York, um, San Francisco Film Society, where I shot the film. So kind of a lot of grant money. And then my producer is a woman named Heather Ray, I met her through the Sundance Labs, and she um, had just done this film, Frozen River, and she went back to some of those investors and said, hey, my last film made money, take a chance on this new, this new director. Um, and then I did a Kickstarter at the very end of the process, uh, which helped get me through post. And then I did everything as absolutely cheaply as possible. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, anyone else? Other questions? Yep. Yeah. Hi, Leah. So nice to see you finally. Yeah, we're Facebook friends. Yes. We're real life friends now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would say it's, it's one of the really beautiful, poetic, and visually stunning films that I've seen. And the romance that actually is right in there is something that I always long for and look for. Uh, but I really wanted to know, when you started writing it uh, for the feature, so did you actually have the same vision to shoot and edit in, in terms of Oh, you know, having it yeah, like grainy okay, so the and. The question is about the writing process, and um, I have a unique way of working um, on this film, which is I had a script, like an outline and a regular script and final draft, and then I also had a visual lookbook that was really expensive, um, and I come from an art, a fine art background, and I'm a photographer as well, and so for every scene in the movie, I'd have a corresponding image whether it was a photograph I'd taken, or a still that I'd find online, or from another film. And um, it was a really useful way of communicating this you know, unique vision of inside my head with the financiers, and with the crew, and with other people outside of my head. Um, that being said, I think around 25% of the film is still improvised. Um, and people often ask, and I don't mean the acting is improvised, um, so that it's not like mumblecore and the actors are making up their lines, it's visually improvised. So we, you know, in the script it would say something like, dragon kills unicorn, and like, who knows what that's going to look like? Um, and there's many ways you could go about that sort of thing. And so we shot the film in stages. We did um, three weeks of just a regular film shoot with the actors on location. And then I went back to New York and I started editing that footage together. And then I got this grant from Tribeca and I was able to do five days of pickups that were just visual experiments. It was just the actress and a small crew and you know, every day would be a different theme. So one day would be water and then one day would be earth. And it was like, okay, we're gonna bury her in the ground and animate some vines and see what happens. And one day was fire and we just lit everything with fireworks. Um, and I let every department head you know, I was like, okay, today's fire day. And the cinematographer was like, I want to try this. And the production designer was like, I've always wanted to explode a cupcake or whatever it might be. And so it was a real, like, visual um, experimentation those five days. And then the animation happened last. Um, and that was just in my living room. <laughs> I went to Home Depot and I bought a lot of plants and a lot of dirt and I poured the dirt on my floor and planted some trees and put these puppets in there and set up a film camera and it was like a frame of film at a time moving puppets for weeks and weeks and weeks. It was incredibly tedious. Um, but even that, we were animating blind. We were on 16 millimeters. We didn't know what it would look like until the film came back from the lab. So it was a real fluid way of working and it was a real luxury to be able to work that way, which you can only really do in independent film. Well, it feels so cohesive. It feels like of a piece, as much as it's improvised or done in and different it's all stages. My brain. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it just like it really feels like a singular thing. Um, another question? Right. Yes, sir. Um, I was curious about.
got the use of, I found the poetic voiceover to be really fascinating, kind of the minimal dialogue. And I was wondering if that came kind of after you had the visual landscape. Yeah. So the question was about the voiceover, and that is another part that was somewhat improvised. So that wasn't scripted in the beginning. Um, because we were shooting on film, which is you know a limited commodity, uh, we ended up doing, we would experiment with the audio. So after we'd wrap for the day, I would take the two actors and our sound mixer, and I would just have them tell each other stories. It was kind of like an acting exercise to stay in character, and we recorded them. And some of those stories, like the one about the cicadas, came from the actress. She grew up in Nashville, and all these insects had just come out of the ground. And it's only every 17 years. And she was only 16 years old. And she was like, they're older than I am. And I was like, I love that. And that ended up being in the film. Um, and once we, once I had a rough cut, I then went back and kind of with the actress, we collaborated on on the voiceover and, and kind of filtering that through. So yeah, maybe it's more than 25% improvised. Maybe it's like 30%. Um, and you in front? Yeah, okay, so the question was about post-production, and um, it was a long post-production process. It was probably around six months total, and um, I also kind of did that in stages. So I went and shot the film, and then I came back, and I went through this <coughs> program in New York called the Edit Center, which is like a school for editors, um, and they pick two films every semester, and all the students use your footage to cut their class project. And I learned about it from another member of Film Fatales, Deborah Granick. She did it with um, Winter's Bone, or Down to the Bone. Winter's Bone? One of her bone movies. Um, and she said it was a great experience. So I was like, okay, I'll do this. It's free. And um, it was amazing. So it was like having 20 assistant editors. And they logged and synced all the film with the sound, and they cut scenes. So I got to come in and talk to the students. And instead of just watching dailies, I actually got to see rough cuts of the scenes. Um, then I got this grant from Tribeca, which let me go film some more. And so while they were editing, I was shooting. And then I got another grant, which let me hire an editor. And, um, and again, because of the way that we shot, we were editing while we were animating. So we had these little placeholder animatics while we were cutting, knowing that there was going to be something there, but we weren't quite sure what. And so having that long extended post-production process allowed for more of this visual and voiceover experimentation. And again, I, wouldn't, I didn't plan it this way, it's just kind of how it all happened, but it ended up being a really wonderful way of working. Um, okay, you again. I don't know, it's, it is a really quiet film, and those are the types of films that I like. I like really, like, Kelly Reichardt's films, and I like kind of quiet, sparse films. I have no idea. I should know, because I've done so many subtitles now in other countries. <laughs> I don't know. Trivia question. <laughs> um, yeah, back here. I have a small question. That why do you choose unicorn, unicorn instead of any other animal? So the question is, why unicorn? Yeah. And um, that came to me through, I actually am not one of those girls who love unicorns, but there are a lot of, I mean, I am now. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I love unicorns. Um, it came from while I was casting and collaborating with my actress and just, you know, outreach to all of these teenage girls. Um, I really, we started our social media, like I knew this film, I wanted it to reach teenage girls in, in addition to a traditional kind of adult, you know, film festival circuit cinephile audience. And teenage girls often don't, go to the movies anymore, and they don't go to film festivals, and they watch everything at home. And so I did a lot of outreach with teenagers even before I started production. And you know we have almost 200,000 fans on Facebook, and almost all of them are, are young girls, young women. And so um, I just, you know, from them, started adding more and more unicorns to the story. And um, I like the unicorn as a metaphor, as this coming of age symbol. It can be you know, a childlike, like little girls like unicorns, like little kids, it's very, like a little plush toy. But it's also this phallic creature and this like majestic adult creature. And so I liked it as, as this metaphor. And then as soon as we had a unicorn, there needed to be a dragon. And then it kind of became, okay, like, you know, this is a girl who's still playing with dolls in a way and holding on to this childhood she never really had a chance to have because she grew up so quickly. 
and yet by the end of the film she realizes she doesn't need to rely on this childhood language anymore. so what is the reaction like from the teenage girls who come to the screenings that you get to talk to? i mean what are they sort of connected like? the teenage are there any teenage girls here? i'm looking at you because you look so young but now you're college right? um they are amazing you know so we just had a screening in hollywood on tuesday there's a hundred teenage girls and like five teenage boys the boys were like squirming a little um, but some of these girls ask some of the most incredible questions they're so self-possessed um, so smart and uh you know i actually learn more from them often and we'll do these kind of conversations after and one of them it was a 14 year old girl she was with her mom and I was like, oh, you're a little young for this. And, and her mom was like, well, what did you think of the sexuality in this film? And she said, from watching this film, I learned that if you're in a situation with a boy, and even if you like him, and you want to be there, and you put yourself there, if at any time during that sexual situation you change your mind, that's OK. Wow. And I was like, that's amazing. It took me until like my late 20s to figure that out, you know? <laughs> um, so often these young women, I mean, I'm sure it's a self-selecting group, the ones who come to you as film, but um, I'm very impressed by them. And they are hungry for more stories that reflect any part of their reality. You know, not everyone's teenage experience is Twilight or The Hunger Games or American Pie. You know, there's so it's few. Not the Hunger Games. You know, and those, I'm glad those films exist, and I think they serve a purpose, and it's great to have any films with female protagonists. But you know, we need the art films too. We need other other perspectives. So um, I can totally see this becoming like a cult yeah. teen movie. So for those, I think a couple people are live streaming it. So for people watching at home, you can download this film right now um, at IBelieveInUnicorns.com. So. But please also come see it in the theater with me, because this is so much more fun to see it big. Um, the people can watch it at home, too. Oh, should we keep going? Or? Uh, yeah, we can take two more questions. Okay. okay. Um, you mentioned that this was your first feature as well as your um, lead actor. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your rehearsal process. So the question's about the rehearsal process, and I had no rehearsal process, um, because we were working on such a low budget. Um, and we had to film during the summer, because she was in high school. I think I had one day for rehearsal. So um, so we didn't rehearse. Instead, we just went out and got ice cream, and hung out, and talked about the movie. And um, and then I filmed it chronologically, so that you know she was learning as we were going. And in many ways, I think she really fell in love with his character. You know, as we were making the movie, I mean, it was a real, at the end of the film, she wrote me this lovely letter saying, I really came of age, like, during the making of this film. And she, you know, learned how to swim, and I mean, all kinds of things um, happened during the movie. So, unfortunately, we didn't rehearse, um, but that wasn't by choice, it was just by, by design. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, let's go here, because you're new. Hi. Hi. Oh, so we met in Avignon when I was there on the short film. Cool. You won that festival. Oh, awesome. I don't even remember. Um, that festival, I don't even think it exists anymore. This is in France, at the festival in France. Um, I don't know. I think every project kind of takes its path. The hardest thing, I mean, raising financing, honestly, is the hardest part of making films. Um, and I think you know, for all the filmmakers here, that's the reality. Um, being a filmmaker is hard. Being an independent filmmaker is hard. Being a woman director, even harder. Person of color, even harder. I mean, you can keep adding to that. And I think the one thing that pushed me into getting this film made was internally me deciding I was making this film. And um, I think a lot of artists, they're kind of waiting for permission. You're waiting for someone else to come along and greenlight your project and write that check or get that grant or get into Sundance Labs or whatever it is. And you can't wait for permission. You gotta give yourself permission and just go make the film. And it's better to make a flawed first feature than not make a film. And so um, I got that advice from Kim Pierce, who directed Boys Don't Cry, which was a film that was really important to me when I was a teenager growing up. And I now give it to everyone. And that's the idea behind Film Fake Halls as well, is it's these women directors who have been kind of shut out of the process for so long, giving each other the permission and saying, okay, maybe don't go make that $2 million film, make the $100,000 film, but I'll crew for you, I'll produce for you, I'll co-write with you. Um, yeah. <coughs> On that note, 
I think we're going to end this yeah. conversation, yeah. but I'll stick around and we can talk one on one. So thank, thank you so you much so for being here.